Hey, welcome to The Deeper Dive. In The Deeper Dive, we go deeper into some aspect of the previous week's sermon from one of our, especially our three pastors here. I've got the, the eyes in Richland from Prosser and from uh, Pasco. Good to see you guys today. How's it going? Good, Dave. It's going good. well, Dave. Going well. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Hey, so uh, we get together and talk about our messages. Adam, you kind of lead this team and we kind of plan out what we're going to do. So you made a, you actually led us into a bit of a switch here in the last two weeks. Hmm. Uh, you want to just tell us about that switch and what we're doing? With the uh, Advent series? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I have, guys, I remember, forget what month it was, but we sat down as a teaching team a couple times and we're thinking about Advent and how we wanted to slice it out this time. You know, do we do the birth narratives, prophecies, and we whiteboarded and came up with what we're doing, which is who is Jesus and kind of coming at it from a unique way of looking at some of the opposite aspects of who Jesus is and how um, they might be maybe ones we gravitate toward at the expense of the other and how to hold those together to get the whole Christ and the whole picture of Christ. So two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that Jesus is both truly God and truly man. And this last Sunday, we looked at the reality that Jesus is both the lion and the lamb, the one who conquers and the one who is conquered. And then next week, we're going to look at Jesus being both high and lifted up, but also lowly. Okay. Kind of these paradoxes. Of, paradoxes, yeah. Paradoxes of theology. Mm-hmm. Okay. Surrounding the person of Jesus. And, and the that, hope, yeah, sorry. Our, uh, sort of the hope too is to be able to give something to all the people who are engaging with us on Sundays throughout Advent. Um, people who have intellectual struggles with Jesus, people who might be one-sided with Jesus, people who are just like, I don't know who Jesus is. Tell me about him. And, and maybe having some conversation that stirs love for Christ in anyone that visits with us during Advent. That's really good. Can so I, you, oh, go ahead. Brooks, well, I was going to maybe add something on there too, yeah. that maybe for people who um, just have not spent time thinking deeply about Jesus, that, mm-hmm. that no, dare I say like a VeggieTales Jesus or a mm-hmm. Sunday school Jesus, an Awana Jesus. I don't know. I didn't do Awana. Dude, I was Awana for I didn't a long do Awana. Time. Don't knock it. I'm sorry. I didn't Improved do Awana. Improved workmen are not ashamed. I didn't do Awana. I didn't do Oral Rangers. I didn't do any. I don't. I don't know. I went to VBS though. Awana, they gave you like the crown, and then every time you memorize enough verses, you get a jewel, and then you'd compare how many crowns and jewels you had with uh, the other yes. people. I'm, I'm guessing think, you had a ton of them, didn't you? I didn't actually. No, had, you didn't have like two vests just full of these. Things. I always had just enough, <laughs> but was always jealous of the kids that had more. <laughs> So call them up. You can school them now, man. I believe. Yeah, I don't know. Let's go. I don't, I never was quite convinced that it created exactly. We were like bragging about how many crowns we had to throw at Jesus's feet compared to each other. So, but I love Awana. And are you going to, you're going to have so many jewels in your crown in heaven though. Mm. I think you would compare that. (laughs) That's pretty hilarious. Uh, not being not grown up that right. way, like yeah. I remember when Jason was here, you, you guys would be talking about the way you guys you raised them. Me and Jason are like, yeah, that wasn't us. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? The uh, kind of the um, the theme, Adam, you've kind of placed on this is who is Jesus, and then you go into the uh, kind of the paradoxical um, ways of looking at Christ. Mm-hmm. So, if we were to jump into how our culture today. How do you th- how do you think the culture sees Jesus? Like, who is Jesus today? I mean, if 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 Christian people, if if we in the church struggle with who he is, putting these opposite things together, I mean, what do you think? How does our how does our society see Jesus? I would guess it's just really fractured, um, which is comes more and more true of our society. Like, we get more fractured all the time. Mm. Uh, I I don't know if I mean if the if the culture outside of church is really spending all that much time wrestling with it, like of mm-hmm. really who is Jesus. Um, I guess they they would raise the question of is is that relevant, right? Like, um, d- why does that matter? Does it matter? Uh, pr- probably some hey good teacher kind of stuff, maybe legend. Uh, it, it would be further removed versus like in the church where we've really like really kind of created different versions of Jesus based on our like culture or subculture. Mm. I, I don't even know if it's in, in their framework for the most part. Or, or they're yeah. satisfied with a picture of Jesus that they've received from a friend or a family member that's partial Jesus and they're rejecting 
that piece. Kind I noticed of. that like a straw man. Yeah, I, but they may not know it's a straw man. Like I noticed that with a lot of deconstruction stories with people inside the church. I don't, I don't want to recognize like there are like not all not every story is the same, right? And some of them come out of like deep pain from the church, and like there's a lot that's a lot of care that's needed in those situations. Some of the stories I hear and I read about them. I just can't help. I'm like, I wish I could, not that I could make a difference, but have a conversation with that person and be like, you realize mm-hmm. that your experience with that church or that tradition is not all that Jesus has to offer. And like the Jesus that you have been taught is not the whole Jesus. In fact, that may not even be Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, by the way, when you say deconstruct, what, what do you mean? By, by we're, we're Christian, we're people that have been raised in Christianity or have walked with the Lord for a while are pulling apart the pieces of their faith and saying, sometimes coming to the conclusion of like, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Some people will re- deconstruct so they can reconstruct that maybe a healthier view of Jesus. Mm-hmm. But many just say like, I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with the church. And oftentimes those stories are, are heartbreaking because you're like, man, you haven't experienced like what life could look yeah. like with Jesus, with the whole Christ. And so I think in the culture, maybe people are settling for an image of Jesus that we might even say like, oh man, like you don't have the right picture. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Don't, don't you think we all kind of look go, look through a keyhole Someone's looking through a keyhole, and maybe what you see of Jesus is true, but you're missing like the greater picture, yeah. right? Yeah. You're focused in on one thing. You're emphasizing one thing of his. Um, Adam, you, in your message here from two weeks ago, you kind of put these paradoxical sides of Jesus together, and it, you use a really a, a word I'd never heard before. It was called a repellent doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is that again? Um, I mean, repellent is something that you're like, that's, I, I can't even get close to that because it's, it's offensive. And I got that from C.S. Lewis when he was working at Oxford back in the 40s and 50s. You, have you guys heard of this? The no. Oxford Socratic Club. It was like a group of intellectuals that he would meet with and they would talk and discuss matters of faith and how it connects to other things. And he would give weekly discussions on what he called repellent doctrines, mm-hmm. like things that were either puzzling or implausible to the human mind. And he, like you guys, like C.S. Lewis would just tackle it head on and discuss it with with these students and try to basically show how inside of these things that seem so implausible is something that God has concealed that's good for us. So they're worth exploring, not giving up on. So the it, God man one is like, I mean, to so many people huge. it's repellent because it's like, yeah. how, that's not even possible. Right. Sounds right. like a contradiction. Yeah. Right. Have you guys, this might be a terrible question, but have you guys ever felt like sometimes the way Jesus, as he has revealed in the New Testament, that it, at times, you you as you are sharing that with people, you almost feel like, oh man, I, I kind of need to not apologize, but I need to explain this. I, I get, I give you an example. I remember once uh, we were talking about Christ, and let's see, what was it? He uh, when he was he was talking about unless you eat my blood and drink mm-hmm. my or drink my blood and eat my body, you have no part of me. And it says, and many of his disciples left. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at that going. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so why 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 didn't Jesus chase after him? Excuse me, that was a metaphor. That was a metaphor. He didn't didn't apologize. He just turned to the to the other the rest of his disciples and said, uh, "What about you guys? What are you going to do? You going to keep following me or are you going to leave as well?" So mm. anyway, have you guys does that ring true to you or is that something odd to you that no, I I actually I don't feel like I need to explain anything. I feel good with it. I I, th- I I go just the opposite, I think. I think I don't do a good enough job of explaining and living out how I think Jesus would would act. I, I would go the other way. I, I feel like I need to apologize for the church at times for not for not being Jesus like in our actions or in our emphases. Um I think of um uh, how how Jesus treated the least of these. Um, and how Jesus, yeah, uh, ate, ate with sinners. Okay. That's, that's, if you didn't eat with sinners, he would have eaten every meal alone for one, but <laughs> the, he, he dined with people that other people in society didn't want to have anything to do with. And he almost like sought them out. I think like Zacchaeus, mm-hmm. right. Um, or, uh, yeah, the, 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 prostitute who came and 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 wiped his wiped his feet with tears and uh like obviously she felt comfortable enough with him to to go approach him. like the that seems so uh like like the church isn't really living up to those standards so i if anything i actually go the opposite way i feel like i need to apologize or kind of smooth things out of in my own life or the church 
that I'm a part of. You don't feel like that uh, when you're when you are talking to people about these more difficult beliefs. Like you don't feel like a, a like I need to apologize for how implausible it seems to the human mind. Is it more? Is it easy for you just to be like, no, this is what it is, and like I don't feel bad about it or feel like mm-hmm. I have to apologize. Like it's truth. You should believe it. And like, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's tr- true. I I I I think I would encourage. I think where I go is encouraging people to like just just don't just don't neglect this without thinking about it. Hmm. Um, hmm. Spend some time digging into, into into these implausible thoughts that, that might seem repellent doctrines, and and see what comes up. Dig dig a little bit. So I I don't know. Hmm. I I think I'm I think I'm hearing what you're saying. Well, speaking of repellent, or or at least. Things, some things that th- seem fantastical. Uh, you guys' message from last week at, out of uh, Romans, uh, Romans, out of Revelation chapter five, which goes up into heaven, into the heavens. I mean, there are some fantastical things in this chapter about um, you know the slaughtered lamb standing right in the th- at the throne. So, Adam, you have said that you absolutely love this chapter, chapter five, that has yeah. made made a big impact on you. Like, what is it? What is it in this? I'll go back to this word again, maybe a fantastical uh, glimpse in heaven. Why is this chapter so encouraging to you? Why, why are you so mesmerized by it? That's honestly a hard one to explain. It's kind of like when you're, um, when you're overtaken and awed by something in creation and you're just like, you want to keep looking at it and you keep being drawn back to it because it does something in you. I, I don't even honestly know how to explain why this passage always does that to me. But it just hits you at a deep level. There's, yeah, there's just something about like, John's deep emotion of like who can open the scroll and then this picture of Jesus as the lion and the lamb, the way that John paints that picture of Jesus and then the response of the people crying out, worthy are you? It, there's just something there that like it gives me chills every time I read it mm-hmm. and I can't even explain to you all the reasons for exactly what it even mm-hmm. means in all of its depth. It just, there's a few passages like that in the Bible and this is one of them that just I love. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things in here that is, the, 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 to me, it kind of blows me away in this repellent doctrine between both being a lion and a lamb. He's not just called the lamb. He's called like one like a slaughtered uh-huh. mm-hmm. lamb. I mean, you just think of like not this really like nice looking lamb. It, mm-hmm. I mean, to me, that sounds like bloody and graphic. I don't know. Did it strike you guys the same way? Yeah. I mean, to me, like the, there's a even even though the contrast of the passage was like there's the lion and there's the lamb, there's a contrast within the lamb itself. Mm-hmm. It's a slaughtered lamb with seven horns, mm-hmm. the symbol of his ultimate power, yep. and the seven eyes, seven spirit thing would be like his, his seeing all, the, the omniscience. Mm-hmm. And it's still like the slaughtered lamb. Like the tension is right. seen even in the, just in the image of the like standing. lamb itself. Yeah, standing, That's also standing, standing victoriously. Being yeah. Slain yeah. and slaughtered, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I it just blows my mind. I, what I hope people see in this, why well, you can see a lot of things. I hope people see the the lengths to which God goes to redeem His people. Yeah. Um. Because like everything you just said, Matthew, that okay, this lamb has seven horns. This, this symbol of of um, victory and power. Uh. These seven eyes. This all knowing. So we have this all powerful, all knowing lamb that is slain and what we see here is uh shoot now i'm um that that he that he he is worthy because he yeah so verse uh verse nine and your your blood has ransomed people for god from every tribe and language and people and nation that is why that lamb is slain because god wanted to ransom his people so much that this all-powerful god became became yeah. slain um something that that the only way that we could be ransomed is is, is that and that's got to be part of like what's in the scroll mm-hmm. god's god's plan for a ransom redeemed people and the only one that can open it is the one that's worthy and it's like man you were slain and spilled your blood to ransom this people so now you get to open this scroll that holds both judgment for the world but also redemption i mean you're you're going to be turning 
the people of God into the kingdom of priests. Mm -hmm. And like Jesus gets to do that because he's the one who was slain. And yeah, that's just incredible. You talk about C.S. Lewis and and say, I should got to, I got to go here because (laughs) Lion, Wish in the Wardrobe, right? I think we've all read it. And um, if you haven't read it, go read it. Uh, But what, what is the, what does the lion say to the witch that like there's a, there's a deeper magic, deeper magic. Yeah. Yeah. I I was there when it was written. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like, I feel like that's like, is that what's in the scroll? (laughs) The deeper, that, magic. the deeper magic, the, the, this, this contract that says like, no, this is actually mm. by my actions, by being slain, I actually redeem these people. Um, I think what blows me away is it when I think of a lion, I mean, as <clears throat> you, you, you think of power, yeah. you think of majesty, you think of something regal and that's, I mean, that's, there are times that's what we want. We want God to demonstrate his power. We want God to crush evil. We want him to reveal himself and be lifted up. Mm-hmm. But the way he does it is through being the slaughtered lamb. And the way he redeemed us wasn't through um, this, you know, uh, rolling in, at least in, in his, uh, his initial coming to us. It wasn't in rolling in and being accepted as a king. It was through hanging on a cross. It was being yeah, up there like naked defeated, and you know. bloody and beaten to, a, beaten to a pulp. Which in John, who wrote the Gospel of John and Revelation, the way that he, like the structure of that book, the enthronement of Jesus as king is when he's lifted up on the cross. Mm-hmm. Like that's just crazy. That is like, crazy. The king is the one who's crucified and raised up for all to see, mm-hmm. which is the, the lion, right? Who's the lamb. So Dawson, you, you started, you asked us, you started this conversation by asking the man, do you think people have a, or what, what do you think people in, 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 in our culture think about Jesus? Yeah. I kind of bring it back there. It, does this how I say how much of this image of Jesus is missing in our world? Because I think we'd all agree that it is missing in our mm-hmm. culture. How much of this image is missing in our culture? I, mean, I think a huge pieces are missing in the culture. I think if we're being honest, and, and a lot of it's missing in church because we breeze past mm-hmm. it too quick. Ooh. I think everyone would affirm Matthew, that. It's Matthew, true. Matthew it's went there. there. <laughs> we would we would affirm it's true. Yeah. But sometimes we just breeze past that when we don't think about what that really, yeah, yeah, what that really means. We're like, oh, sweet, I'm safe. Thank you, Jesus. Good call. <laughs> right? Like we don't really sit on like, man, like the King that He died for me, and then in addition, like, what does that mean for how I'm supposed to live my own life? Yeah, you remember that? Go back to C.S. Lewis, the line, the witch, and the wardrobe. Is it um, Lucy? Lucy might ask the Beavers about Aslan. Is he yeah. safe? And they're like, is is he safe? Like, of course he's not safe. Like this tension of like the mm-hmm. king, because he's gracious, like he welcomes us into life with him, but he's also king. And so if you... Doesn't if you, he actually say he's, he's not a tame He's a good lion, lion. But he's not a tame Yeah, he's not, yeah, yeah, he's not yeah, safe, like, but he's You good. don't get to just approach yeah. him however you want. It, it comes with a commitment to him and obedience to him and uh, an allegiance to him. Yeah. Which again, just talking about another paradox. But if we're missing that in our own... My point is if we're missing that in our own hearts, like mm-hmm. that's going to spill out into yeah. the culture and yep. uh, like... There, there is something that we as believers have to be able to be able to communicate to some degree a more captivating image yeah. of what we believe. Like we we hold the greatest truths in yeah. the entire world, mm. and sometimes we reduce them to kind of cliches that we can throw out real fast. Yeah. When like, man, that's not what John's doing. Like he paints what a beautiful picture mm-hmm. of who Jesus is, mm-hmm. and yet you know sometimes we just are we're just very shallow about it. Like it's just yeah. kind of. Mm-hmm. Just kind of there, and yeah. and then we wonder why other people aren't captivated by it. And to be bold, you know, to be bold about bringing these opposite views of Christ or these repellent doctrines of Christ, bringing them together when mm-hmm. it is very difficult for us to bring them together in our own minds. Yeah. Well, guys, I think you know we're we as leaders in the church, like we want to be Jesus people. We want to, that's that's what we are, man. We are followers of Christ. So I think you you know just here in this last twenty minutes, I mean, what a great challenge for us to like preach Jesus. Uh, there's a church in Portland. Adam, have you heard of you've heard of Henson Church? Yeah. On their pulpit, uh, when you go up there, I spoke there a few times. There's a little plaque, and it says it quotes. Ah, it's one of the Gospels. It's when these Gentiles came to see G- Jesus, right? And it says, "Sir, we would see Jesus." It's mm-hmm. it's uh, they covered on the plaque. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was that's pretty cool, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's part of our job is to reveal Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to I want to thank you guys for the way you guys preach. Um, I, Matthew, I hope we don't, I don't think we do, man. I think we, we don't preach just platitudes and morality. And, but I think, man, what a great challenge for us to be bold, mm-hmm. to, re, to, just to reveal who Christ is. 
Um, because man, when we put this out, to, put out there who he is, these repellent doctrines of him, um, I think will blow people away. But also, we man, we will we do this boldly, and we will reveal who Christ is to people. Yeah. Well, thanks you guys. Just really appreciate you guys. It's just really fun working together with you guys. Yeah, well, anyway, you. this is the deeper dive, and uh, if you would like to go. Uh, if you'd like to check out more of what we do, we're at Bethel Church. You can get onto our website, which is Bethel.ch.